this is the, the post-lunch panel. We've lost one of our panelists, David Kramer, unfortunately, who deals with the entire world, has to do with the crisis now in Egypt, I gather, this morning. Uh, so he won't be available, unfortunately. But anyway, we still have three excellent speakers. And let me set a little bit of context here. Uh, what we'd like to do now is to look at what the Poland-Russia dialogue means for the countries in between, or the common neighborhood, uh, particularly for Belarus and Ukraine. We don't have anybody from Moldova, so it's very difficult to address. And I think it's a little bit removed from the Polish context anyway, whereas Belarus and Ukraine are immediate neighbors, very important countries to Poland. Now, I believe there is one fundamental question here, uh, that needs to be asked. Does the Warsaw Moscow rapprochement make these states feel more secure or less secure? For example, is Russia less inclined to try and uh, rebundle these countries, to use an energy term, uh, because Poland may be toning down the campaign for NATO enlargement eastwards, because the Eastern Partnership uh, seems to be, if not fading, seems to be running out of steam? Or conversely, does the Kremlin perceive Warsaw's policies as potential weakness in decision, uh, encouraging it to exert even greater pressure on Belarus, Ukraine, and other post-Soviet countries, uh, and undermining their sovereignty? And an additional question, I think, which is worth exploring, and again, it's a pity David's not here, but maybe our speakers could, could look at this as well, is what impact, if any, does the Polish-Russian dialogue have on the d democratization process in the region. One, uh, are governments that feel secure more likely to democratize than those that feel under threat? And secondly, does taking Russia as it is, to quote uh, the Polish Foreign Minister, mean that Poland and the EU should take Belarus, Ukraine, and others as they are, uh, and not push the democracy agenda? Or are there different standards here at work for Russia and its near neighbors, the countries in between? Anyway, you know, feel free to answer or not answer these questions. I just wanted to raise them. And in order of appearance, we have three uh, excellent, eminently qualified speakers. First of all, in order of appearance, Mikola Ryabchuk, Research Fellow, Institute of Political and Ethnic Studies of the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. Uh, who can give us a Ukrainian perspective on the Warsaw-Moscow rapprochement. Second, Yaroslav Romanchuk, president of the Scientific Research Center in Belarus, uh, who can explain how Belarus fits into this regional picture. And third, uh, Mikhail Dolbilov, assistant professor, Department of History, University of Maryland, who is well qualified to give us a more of a historical perspective on the Polish-Russian thaw. Is it a flash in the pan, or is there real food on the plate? <laughs> I thought I'd throw that in after lunch, sounds good. Okay, okay we'll, we'll start with Mikola, and, then, and I don't know whether you want to come up here or speak from, maybe easy to speak from the table. Yeah. It's up to you, yeah? If I might. Sure. It's more convenient. Uh, thank you for uh, introduction, and thank you for invitation, but also uh, thank you for uh, for the recognition of the fact that uh, there are some uh, countries, there is some, there is some common neighborhood between uh, Russia and Poland. Uh, I represent this neighborhood. Actually, this neighborhood is, is made up of uh, two countries only, Ukraine and Belarus. And uh, so we have uh, full representation here of, of, of the entire neighborhood. Uh, well, um, uh, in, uh, in my way uh, to Washington, I happened to be a few days in Slovakia, and in the hotel, uh, I picked up, uh, just incidentally picked up a newspaper left by some, probably by some Russian tourists. Uh, it was newspaper Komsomolska Pravda. Uh, it's very, very interesting newspaper. <laughs> well, uh, please, please don't laugh because it is the most, uh, it's, it's, it's a newspaper which has the highest circulation in Russia, daily newspaper. It has daily, it's published daily uh, 600 copies and uh, two and a half million on a weekend. A uh, newspaper which uh, made uh, made very interesting evolution from Komsomol, uh, com Komsomol house, uh, mouthpiece to uh, yellow tabloid, but still they retained their uh, title, Komsomolska Pravda, and they retained all the orders on, on the title, uh, Le orders of Lenin and, uh, and, and on and on and on, uh, five, five orders together. Well, uh, it drew my attention because of, uh, of course, bec because it was related to our uh, eventual uh, discussion. Uh, first of all, there was very interesting 
an article inside uh, under the title Myth um, about uh, millions of raped uh, Germans was invented by Hebels. Um, it's, it's a huge article. Uh, and uh, another one on, on the uh, cover page uh, is, is a quotation from uh, Mr. Lavrov, the head of uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia. Um, uh, is entitled, um, this outrageous action wouldn't uh, remain without our response, without, without our retaliation. Uh, he refers to uh, alleged uh, machinations at the Eurovision contest, uh, song contest. Uh, just Please just imagine any uh, politician in, uh, in any country who would react to whatever happens and some, you know, pop, pop song competition. But f from the Russian uh, point of view, it's very important. It's a political issue, and it should be uh, retaliated. So uh, why I um, uh, made this reference? Uh, I feel it's very difficult to carry out any dialogue with uh, the partner like this. It's really, uh, it's not quite clear uh, how to do this and uh, who is a partner actually in this dialogue. Uh, because uh, on one hand, uh, you have, uh, probably you have um, Russian government, uh, various governmental institutions, and probably you have also uh, Russian society, which uh, can be also a partner. Uh, but uh, as to the government, of course, as, uh, Ms., uh, as Dr. Uh, Sher very aptly uh, pointed out, uh, it's kind of uh, a corporation which pursues uh, personal, rather personal or so corporate interest rather than um, national interest. Uh, somebody may call it a mafia state, so of course it's very difficult to have a mafia state as a partner. Uh, state which pursues uh, zero-sum game, and uh, as you know, it's very difficult to to compromise uh, with a partner who pursues uh, a zero-sum game. Um, of course, um, any 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 politics is a sort of uh, of uh, pragmatist pursue, uh, whatever uh, it means, um, and uh, and. Um, uh, any 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 politician has to 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 find some trade-off between uh, bigger and lesser evil, between uh, values and interests, between ideology and morality. So uh, Western, Western politics are not uh, exceptions from, from this rule. They, they have, to, they have to, to find this trade-off, to, to, uh, to pursue this trade-off. But the difference is that, that they still, usually they, they, they do this. They, usually they try to, to take into account uh, some, uh, some values, some uh, moral considerations. And uh, their opponents on the Russian side usually do not care about this. And uh, again, uh, early in the morning, we uh, discuss this, this kind of pragmatism. Uh, so uh, society is a, uh, the state is a very difficult partner, as, as you see. And what about society? Society is also a very problematic partner because it's, uh, it's harassed, it's repressed, it's uh, atomized. Um, so uh, it's also very, very difficult to, to, to cooperate. Uh, still, it doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, the um, dialogue is not needed. Of course, uh, first of all, um, the state, the government, the governmental institutions are not monolithic. Probably there are different people. We, at least we 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 would like to believe that there are very different people, and uh, maybe s uh, cooperation with some of them would uh, eventuate would uh, bring some fruits in the future. Uh, society also does exist uh, in Russia and uh, it also can be a partner. Moreover, I, I would uh, I dare to argue that uh, the dialogue with the state, with the government, uh, facilitates or actually enables a dialogue with society because, you know, <laughs> society in civil society in Russia is castigated as, as, as foreign agents. Uh, so, of course, it's much easier to carry out dialogue with society if you at the same time carry out dialogue with. Uh, with uh, with a state. Uh, so what uh, what does this dialogue Polish Polish uh, Russian dialogue means for for Ukraine? Uh, first of all, I'd like you uh, to um, to keep in mind that all these neighboring countries, not only Ukraine and Belarus, but also all uh, neighbors of the European Union, <coughs> are um, uh, challenged, as uh, Josef Langer put it. Um, long ago, uh, all these countries are challenged. Uh, in all these countries, European Union is, is challenged by some other spiritual power. Uh, Muslim fundamentalism in uh, North Africa and uh, uh, Middle East, and uh, some sort of uh, Russian Orthodox, Slavonic, Eurasian uh, messianism 
in the case of, of Russia. Uh, all these countries, as uh, Josef Langer argues, uh, are involved in a sort of cold civil war about adoption or rejection of uh, Western values, including Russia itself, including Turkey, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so uh, obviously everything, uh, everything that helps to, to, uh, to tip the balance, to change this equilibrium, uh, to promote uh, Western values uh, in Ukraine, uh, in Russia, is, uh, is welcome. And secondly, um, a Polish-Russian dialogue establishes uh, the new pattern of relations with Russia that might be emulated sometimes by Ukrainian. <laughs> uh, it's a very good, very good example how middle-sized uh, country uh, by the virtue of its uh, good standing, of its very successful reforms, of its uh, um, authori uh, authority uh, within the EU, uh, by its successful economic um, politics, uh, uh, is, uh, or became, uh, became a real and serious a partner in such a dialogue. Um, <clears throat> so I cannot imagine uh, such a dialogue uh, in the case of Ukraine. Uh, I cannot imagine uh, some, you know, group uh, for uh, difficult uh, matters, uh, to, uh, discussing difficult matters between Ukraine and Russia, even though we have probably as, as many difficult uh, issues as Poland uh, has with Russia. Uh, but so far, uh, Ukrainian-Russian uh, relations, of course, they uh, do not look, look like any sort of, of uh, of uh, dialogue. It's rather relations between uh, Robinson Crusoe and Friday. Uh, Robinson Crusoe uh, loves Friday, as you know, but as long as Friday recognizes superiority of, uh, of uh, Robinson. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this, you know, this, uh, this does not mean, of course, a complete subordination of um, Ukraine to uh, Russia. And uh, here I uh, would definitely disagree with uh, colleagues who predict some sort of uh, Ukraine's, uh, Ukraine's uh, maybe not absorption, but Ukraine, Ukraine joining the customs union. I, I, I don't think it would happen uh, whenever. Uh, just because, you know, just, just because um, if you have one powerful mafia state, uh, this mafia state can be contained either by a rule of law, by some uh, legal system, as it happens in, in Poland, and Poland is very careful about penetration of Russian economy, of, Ukraine, of Polish economy by this very dubious uh, Russian capital, which is not just capital, it's, uh, it's political capital, it's uh, connect, politically connected capital. Uh, or uh, all mafia, powerful mafia state can be con contained by another mafia state, and this is what happens in Ukraine. And this is the main reason why Ukraine would never <coughs> join, join customs union. Even if we can imagine that it, it happens, um, it wouldn't work anyway. Uh, probably you notice that within the past 20 years, there were a lot of uh, integration projects uh, promoted by Russia. Maybe I can count, count a dozen of them. And not a single of, the, of them worked. Uh, yesterday, I read that Armenia uh, didn't uh, participate, yes, uh, didn't move recently to the um, uh, meeting of uh, Tashkent uh, military uh, bloc, military agreement. It's a very, very interesting sign. I don't, so far, I don't, know, I don't know what it means, but anyway. Uh, um, all these uh, all these integration projects um, were, um, were uh, are allegedly accepted by uh, by, the, by Russia's neighbors. Not a single of them uh, is strong enough to say no. Uh, maybe Georgia tried, but you know uh, you know the story. Uh, all other uh, neighbors usually say yes, but, and this but is very important. Uh, they. Um, they uh, pretend uh, they accept these projects, they pay lip service to them, but they use all sorts of sabotage uh, to derail this project. Uh, and this is why uh, so far neither uh, uh, allegedly pro-Russian Lukashenko was good for, uh, for, uh, for Kremlin, nor Mr. Voronin, nor Shevardnadze, because you know, Kremlin, Kremlin usually does not, uh, does not need uh, friendly governments in neighborhoods, they, uh, they need uh, fully obedient government. So they don't need uh, Lukashenko or Voronin or Shevardnadze, they need somebody like uh, Mr. Kadyrov. But I wonder if any, any neighbors would agree to have such a government. So uh, to sum up, um, I believe that uh, Polish uh, 
uh, Russian dialogue is, is very important, but it's important rather as a process, not as a result. So far, we cannot expect any uh, palpable results from this, uh, pro uh, from this uh, process. But the process, per se, is, uh, is important. Uh, it gives uh, us some, some chances, and it can be considered a result uh, by itself. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we have in our Eurovision Song Contest the Belarusian representative, Yaroslav, it's all yours. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here and uh, knowing that I will be speaking after lunch, I think that visual aid would facilitate post-lunch understanding. So that's why I have uh, prepared some slides for uh, to see, to grab the difficulty or the complexity of the process. And if you have a look at the uh, Coats of arms of three countries. You see two eagles, and you see just a round or, or, or ball, right? And it's extremely difficult to uh, find a place for an independent country with its own foreign policy within such two great powers. And in Belarus, many people perceive and the authorities, Lukashenko, Poland, as, a, as an empire. That's why uh, by trying to un un explain uh, the hostility toward Poland, they say, well, they would like to uh, restore its borders as of 1939. And when I was running for parliament in 2006, one of the accusations I got from the authorities was that I would like, if I, if I had won, I would have sold Grodna to Poland. So that's kind of the propaganda the authorities use. But just looking at the courts of arms, I uh, came up with the uh, concept of Belarusian foreign policy or uh, strategic policy vis-a-vis -vis Polish Russian integration and this is the strategy called Kalabok for those of you who know Russian uh, fairy tale that's easy right it's a round little bun that happens to be smart and cunning so he tries to escape from different uh, animals and uh, there are many animals around so uh, Lukashenko is smart enough to escape the deadly embraces of all its neighbors, primarily of that of Russia. So, in, before if you want to understand the behavior of Lukashenko, it's very important to understand what Belarusians are. So, first of all, we are two nations within one state. These are the uh, uh, poll result that was conducted in February, March. And you see the uh, very strict division between Belarusians. I'm not talking about Belarus. Uh, this is not the opinion poll conducted by uh, presidential administration. This is the opinion poll conducted based on IRI and uh, Gallup methodology, so we can somehow trust it. So you see that uh, there's a division line that comes exactly in half. Is country going in the right direction? 38% says yes, 47 wrong. Democracy or strong leader? 34 for strongly hand, 56 for democracy. By the way, the word, the number of Belarusians who are in favor of democracy right now is higher than that in Bulgaria, Romania, and Lithuania. Because of the experience that these countries had uh, in, in the last 20 years. Uh, personal freedom, then governance, government has too much influence on your life. 61% said no. Now, that's something that is horrible. In the country where the, the government controls you from cradle to grave, still 40% of the people believe that this is exact influence of the government. Then, uh, do you support privatization? In the country where 80% of the country belongs to the state, 55% uh, of the population believe no, we don't support privatization. Uh, another question is why, but still, if you uh, come up with the policy of privatization, private economy, well, you would rather be in minority. Uh, but at the same time, when people are asked, people are better off in free market than in a country where government plays a major role, 62% believe that free market is better. Uh, the reason is that they know uh, the level of life in Poland uh, and traders, Lithuania, even uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, in Russia, wages are like two, two and a half times higher, and that explains an enormous emigration, labor emigration to Russia, uh, and uh, that also is one of the major sources of um, 
domestic uh, demand in the country, uh, the volume of remittances that National Bank admits is over $900 million, but we estimate that to be about $3 billion. So if you add $3 billion earned by Belarusians abroad, mainly in Poland, uh, mainly in uh, uh, Russia, but then Poland and other countries, that's a... Uh, that's how Belarusians ad adjust to the situation that the government cannot create jobs and doesn't let private sector do that. But something that is really important that is the uh, common value ground for Europeans, Russians, and Belarusians. The question about uh, the wealth gap or income gap and whether it is a problem and should the government do that. Now, this is where Belarusians are like, like Europeans. Uh, and egalitarian sentiments are getting stronger and stronger in Europe and Russia, and Belarusians are within this particular trend. But so you see the number, 44.8% both in favor of changes and uh, for status quo. So that's why Lukashenko is trying to please both sides, but of course he's a Soviet type of a collective farmer and a very uh, sophisticated politician that rather relies not on uh, base on uh, formal education, but on his uh, gut feeling. But probably gut feeling is something that works in this situation, because you are uh, in, the situ in the environment that is not so lineal as, uh, as like in relations within the European Union. But that, this is something, another, the final question about Belarusians. Uh, Good laws or good leaders? Again, have a look at the difference. About 60% of the Belarusians believe that good leaders are more important than good laws. So if you manipulate uh, public opinion, you can get, get to the point when, that we don't need any European democracy. We don't need something that Poland has because based on Belarusian television, Poland is... Uh, absolutely subservient as server uh, and servant of NATO, EU, and uh, Lithuania, Poland, uh, other European countries, they don't make decisions of their own. They're just, you know, manipulated by, by uh, Brussels or Washington. So, Belarus and Russia. Uh, we are political partners. Union state that uh, nobody knows what it is, but it's still on paper. Economic partners, customs union, which is nothing but a bunch of holes in... Uh, uh, all sorts of regulation. Military partners, we have uh, uh, also the organization allegedly to challenge NATO, but that's a joke. Strong supporters of Soviet version of the World War II history, and that's when Lukashenko wants, and likewise Putin, to believe that uh, whoever criticizes and tells the truth about what happened in 1939, before that and during the war, is uh, a revisionist. He's an enemy of the state because he does not... Uh, uh, respect the past, the true past. And that's why uh, for Russians and Belarusians, it's such a sensitive issue that w if you start talking about uh, Katyn, about uh, murders, about rapes, as my colleague said, no, 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 you lie. Just They don't want to see facts. They just want to have this wave because this is something that is the only probably solid factor of building up statehood, both in Belarus and in Russia. Religious and ethnic uh, brothers, that's obvious. Partners in anti-NATO, anti-West campaign. Energy partners, including a nuclear power station, that I will talk about a little bit later. Close ties between shadow economy agents, smugglers, and gangs. Something that is underestimated, but gives a lot of uh, economic power to the customs union. It explains why so many people in both countries, primarily in Russia, support this idea, because uh, the way to squeeze money from the Russian budget is done in a very good way using a foreign state. So, formally we are one state, but using uh, these different schemes, both in uh, goods market and in finance, we can really, uh, they, they can really uh, do many things like money laundering, like uh, capital cash outflow from Russia primarily. So, Belarus, uh, doesn't have much to much cash to send out of the country, but it provides services to Russian companies, and Lukashenko is smart in finding partners for this. Belarus and Poland. Again, this is the perception of the authorities. Cold neighborhood. Uh, 
that's obvious. After special after 2010 uh, presidential elections, uh, before that, uh, President, Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs Sikorsky, Westerwelle, were in, in Belarus. We had very high hopes that things would uh, be better off after elections, but uh, reality was absolutely different. Limited trade and investment cooperation due to the uh, investment and the economic mode in inside Belarus, no military co cooperation whatsoever. Agreement on cr cross-border movement of people is on standby. Poland would like to have that, but Belarusian authorities don't want to do that because having one million people going freely to, you, to uh, Poland would mean that many more people would see lies and uh, and the character of Belarusian economic model. Because one of the, if you start talking to ordinary Belarusians about prices, because uh, if you talk about democracy and human rights, well, okay, nobody, well, we have a third of the population who care. But we talk, start, start talking about prices and, and wages, this is where you get the people, right? You have, why is it that fish and apples and the sausage in Poland are twice cheaper than in Belarus, in the so-called socially oriented economy? And now, and even pensioners start gaping. Wow, is it really true? No, you're lying. Expensive and cumbersome visa regime, something that is really uh, a disgrace. We have 60 euro visa, we have huge lines, and again, uh, one of the uh, uh, conflicts, not conflicts, but essentially a scandal is it the way to get registration for getting a Polish visa in Belarus. Now there is a, a kind of, a, one of the versions is that uh, Belarusian uh, telecom monopolist, Bell Telecom, is somehow has his hackers uh, to get all the slots and then sell them to the people for $100, $200. So if you want to go to Poland and get a visa, just imagine 60 euros, and we don't get like one annual or three year visa, we get visa for three months, and you pay like 250, 300 bucks, which is a very effective visa uh, curtain in our situation. And sensitive issue of the Polish minority in Belarus, which I think was inspired partially by Russia in 2005, because Union of Poles, which I'm a proud member of, was a political organization and did not get involved in politics at all. But the assumption was that as it is so big and Polish minority is about half a million people, so they may, be, uh, they may turn political and somehow be the center of resistance to the Belarusian regime, which, which was like a cock and bull story from the very beginning. Uh, Russia's input, and this is uh, almost solely the achievement of Alexander Lukashenko. His unique contribution to this is that there is not a single person in the world that could get so much cash and support from Russia without getting anything in return. Absolutely unique case. He should just uh, study, should teach in Harvard, uh, MIT to, do, to know to explain how to do that. Generous energy uh, integration grant, because when you talk about the uh, parallel uh, uh, comparisons, we have like, okay, Soviet-style country, centrally planned economy, it must be poor. When people come to Belarus, they are shocked because we this is clean country, wide streets, a lot of lights, uh, and the... Uh, the problem is with even a perception of, uh, of Belarus, even in Poland. I remember talking to one Polish businessman. He wanted to understand what's going on in Belarus and saying, do you guys have ATM machines in, in Minsk in Belarus? So do you use banks? Like, because he remembered how it was in Poland in the 80s, it was very poor and uncivilized, and he believed that Belarus is a country like this. So there's definitely a lot of... Uh, misunderstanding because of the way Belarus is covered in Polish media and uh, in Russian media too. But having 25% of Belarusian GDP as an energy grant uh, is definitely something that only an idiot would res refuse to get if the price you pay will come somewhere in like three, four, five years or may not come at all if uh, oil prices fall and Russia start, starts dealing with, uh, well, the, the problem of falling apart. Almost free access to its domestic market, which neither Poland, no European Union, no Ukraine has. Diplomatic inf information support in all areas. Engagement in joint military project including uh, military and uh, arms trade. Belarus uh, increased arms trade by 65% 
there's a recent announcement of the Swedish think tank, and it's not in the Belarusian statistics. Engagement in uh, credits, which is also a very important part to sustain the Belarusian model. Free access to Russian labor market, which Ukraine, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, even Uzbekistan, Tajikistan don't have or have in a, in a limited way. Free access to Russian educational institutions, that's to train, uh, to get young talents to Russia, and visa trade regime, which is also very important. What we get from Poland, again, as perceived by the authorities, tough resolutions uh, that Polish diplomats and European parliamentarians came up with uh, in Brussels. Uh, then support of radical part of Belarusian opposition, those who uh, don't want to talk and just dictator, go and no ties, let's introduce economic sanctions. Information support of TV channel Belsat. Attempts to bring Polish SMEs to, biz, uh, to Belarus. There are some attempts, but uh, in this kind of environment when, Belar when authorities dictate terms of engagement, that's kind of difficult. And uh, which is also important, destination of Belarusian end traders. And these people bought goods, usually buy goods in Poland for about $700 million. So that's extremely good for eastern part of Poland, Białystok and, uh, and uh, this part of region, Lublin, because many Belarusians go there and they have VAT schemes which are very good and they somehow survive without any restrictions from the government. Uh, Lukashenko's input in relations with Russia, so he got so much what he, got, what he uh, does in return. Formal support of the Kremlin integration initiatives. Just formal, because we've been in customs union with uh, Russia since 1995. Few people know that, but formally on paper. So paper is nothing. Reality is absolutely different. Military cooperation, which again, we, we, if we have the probability of a military conflict with Poland uh, less than 1%, well, you can do whatever you want, especially if Russia pays for that. Orthodox Church conquered that and support of conservative values, conservative as Lukashenko in the society, in the post-Soviet society in Belarus. Lukashenko can campaign just on the fact that Europeans is so decadent admitting gay marriages. He just said it's very kind of you know uh, uncivilized remarks, but Belarusians, you know, they still believe that it is something of a moral degradation, and Russian Orthodox Church and both Kremlin also support that. Gas transit, oil transit and refining, opportunities to select Russian oil barons to share oil scheme with Belarus. It's extremely important because if uh, Lukashenko agrees with Igor Sechin, with uh, Guterriev, with Alek Perov, with some other guys on rules of engagement in oil market and they build another oil refinery in Belarus without paying uh, export duty to the Russian budget, so the... Uh, the uh, uh, value of uh, the Russian oil contribution to the Belarusian model will even increase. And something that, again, Lukashenko benefits by using the bans in Russia, Kazakhstan, Poland is gambling. We have probably more uh, casinos now in Minsk than in uh, any European party, and we're getting closer to Las Vegas. That's all cash. That's all, and that now there's, he's looking for a partner to get a bank that would uh, provide offshore services because Switzerland is uh, no longer there. Uh, Vir British Virgin Islands uh, cannot do that. But Belarus is under control, stable, and if he finds somebody from either uh, Europe or Asia or any other country, he can get like one, two trillion dollars to take care about. So uh, if you look at the theme of so-called sanctions versus uh, engagement. I would like to see, uh, to analyze whether there is any impact on the trade. And you see the trade with Poland. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I'll, I'm not finishing. Uh, export to Poland uh, from Belarus about, uh, it did not change much. It's, it's on the same level. While the share of Polish export to European Union, uh, as you see, is just well, 2.1%. It's really very small. It is number five, uh, our trading export partner, uh, unlike Netherlands or Latvia that are huge because the basis of these flows are oil products. Import from Belarus, again, Poland, it didn't change much for the last 10 years. So no matter what politicians do, trade is still there and there is a huge potential in our understanding. So to conclude, 
uh, dependence on Russian resources and market is increasing, and that creates a lot of dangers to Lukashenko because in, by 2015, he either should sell a lot of valuable assets or uh, there will be a different scenario from the Kremlin to challenge Lukashenko politically in the presidential election campaign. Potential of Polish-Belarusian relations still frozen, and think I think that if we... Uh, if Lukashenko somehow uh, is out of politics or he changes his mind, then uh, there will be a lot of uh, improvement in this area. Lukashenko is still playing the role of Kalabog between Russia and EU so far successfully. Belarus is trying to diversify in an orthodox way, meaning gambling, entertainment, uh, money, uh, financial services. Belarus still has assets to sell to make it beyond 2015 without grave political concessions to Russia. And finally, Lukashenko pursues the policy of building bridges with politically powerful billionaires rather than countries and governments, which is also very important to, to note. He may, uh, he tried to deal with Kulchik, he tried to deal with, and he's quite successful in dealing with Austrian uh, rich men, Ukrainians, Russians, and he may be on very bad terms with governments, but if he has money of that kind from billionaires, he doesn't care much because he uh, believes that his reputation is not the factor. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Yaroslav. Very, very informative, wide-ranging. Uh, Mikhail, you're, you're on next. Thank you. Uh, I... I notice that I am the only representative uh, of Russia in this uh, distinguished assembly, but I'm not going to speak uh, on or in behalf uh, of Russia. And uh, uh, my, 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 uh, certainly I, I have a Russian educational and career background, but I teach at an American university for a number of years. And uh, my perspective on the subject of our meeting will be that of, um, of, a, of a historian uh, who, who is practicing uh, research uh, in this field, but uh, stays outside of institutionalized dialogue. I mean, a dialogue institutionalized in uh, such uh, structures or uh, bodies as uh, the uh, mentioned uh, group uh, for uh, difficult issues, complex issues, maybe uh, difficult issues, I think is, it's the, the accepted uh, translation, uh, difficult matter, sorry. Uh, and, uh, but, but I'm involved in a dialogue with a number of Polish, uh, Belarusian, uh, Ukrainian, Lithuanian historians uh, who study the past of this uh, mega region. So my, uh, my focus will be on the so-called politics of history or historical politics or politics of memory uh, between uh, Russia and Poland. Uh, that is, uh, the subject is the, how the uh, actors, political actors or uh, actors cl cl relatively close to politics use uh, the past, use the uh, history, use the past, for uh, political purposes. That is manipulation of the past or uses of the past for um, uh, politics, for political campaigns, for, uh, uh, I for shaping identities, for shaping political attitudes, and so on. And uh, I, will, I will touch upon um, th the similarities and uh, differences between uh, Russian and Polish approaches to uh, historical politics, and I will try to make a point for um, potential potential for furthering this dialogue, uh, historians or the historians' contribution to Poland-Russian dialogue. To uh, just to begin with, uh, I would partly agree and disagree with uh, Mikola about uh, the existence of a dialogue, of any dialogue between Poland and Russia. Um, I wouldn't be so um, uh, pessimistic about, uh, about Russia, Russia's actors or, or about actors on the Russian side, uh, their, their capability of, of, of uh, conducting a dialogue. I think that some dialogue is underway. But uh, what is right is that 
uh, dialog is often a conventional label to uh, define or to, to designate some form of cooperation, some form of rapprochement. Not, not necessarily uh, this rapprochement is really a dialogue, especially as regards uh, historians' uh, analysis or historical analysis or uh, uh, the, the uh, analysis of historical past. Yeah? And, just, um, and sometimes it's just a series of monologues addressed very often not to uh, the opposite, not to the uh, uh, um, other side of presumed dialogue, but to the domestic constituencies to win their support, to win their um, uh, uh, favor, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, uh, really, uh, one can detect uh, some very positive signs in, uh, Polish, in how Polish-Russian relations of the recent years affected uh, the state of, of the, the, the historical memory, so to say, the, this, the uh, discussion of shared past, the discussion of controversial issues about shared past. And um, just uh, getting back to uh, the period of time 10 years ago, for example, uh, we see uh, how, much can, how much passion, um, how much irrational passion was there in Polish-Russian relations, and one can uh, point to extreme forms, uh, extreme uh, patterns of uh, politics of memory. On the Russian side, uh, we can uh, recall uh, such notorious an enterprise as the establishment of the commission, uh, commission to, fight, to, to quote its, its name, to commission to fight falsifications uh, historical falsifications to the detriment of Russia's state uh, interests. Uh, a bit earlier, several years earlier, the uh, Putin government established uh, a, a very controversial new holiday, the Day of National Unity, established in 2005, uh, uh, obviously uh, designed to uh, to rem obviously designed to to recall to remind controversial issues in the Polish-Russian uh, Polish past, uh, namely the, uh, the uh, Polish, the Rzeczpospolita uh, participation in the Russia's, in the Moscow's rather, uh, times of Trebs as early as um, uh, 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 the beginning of the 17th century. So it, it's, it's, it's obvious that very, very distant past was instrumentalized to produce immediate political results. On the Polish side, one could point to um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, a number of manipulations of historical past by the famous Institute of National Memory, a uh, whole institution, a uh, multifunctional institution uh, that uh, whose activity, whose, who, whose, fun, whose uh, functioning uh, stirred up also much controversy in the Polish society. So what happened next and what is, what, what is continuing to um, to, ha to happen, uh, to, 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 to go on now. Uh, one can cautiously, with m many reservations, uh, point to, a, really to a kind of rapprochement between Polish and Russian uh, governments and Polish and Russian historians. And uh, um, we see that the uh, events of the, uh, of, of the events of the 2009-2010 uh, relatively positively affected the discussion of the Katyn uh, uh, massacre, and uh, it's uh, this process began before the Smolensk, uh, Smolensk um, tragedy of 2010, and it was tragically uh, it was facilitated by the Smolensk air crash uh, tragedy, and the Russians the Russian uh, authorities uh, uh, sped up. Uh, uh, the process of passing the volumes of, of the Katyn affair uh, to uh, the Polish uh, part after that. Also, uh, there were several meaningful gestures on the Russian side, uh, highly ritualistic, so to say, not very, so for, from some perspective, just hollow, just paying lip service, but nevertheless meaningful. One of them was uh, the famous Putin's uh, Westerplatte speech of 2009 at the uh, meeting uh, to um, 
uh, to to celebrate the the the, the 50th anniversary uh, of of the uh, uh, sorry the the 60th anniversary of the uh, uh, beginning of the Second World War uh, in, in in September 2009. And uh, uh, in that speech, Putin uh, very reluctantly, not directly, but a uh, drop a mention of the Russian uh, invasion in in Poland in 1939. So that that I mean that 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 mean that meant something uh, against the back, background of the previous rhetoric, uh, previous uh, uh, militant and xenophobic rhetoric uh, that sounded that came to sound like a, a, a like a concession. Um, so uh, the um, uh, also uh, so all this all this served to mitigate a little the state of things in Polish Russian relations. But the question is uh, how uh, in what in what way uh, did historians uh, on both sides on uh, benefit from it? Uh, the uh, dialogue between historians that benefit from this rapprochement. Uh, uh, what was conducted by, so to say, high-placed figures in uh, historical commun in, in respective historical communities of uh, each country? So the um, so the, the level of discussion was so the discussion was very closely related to uh, uh, to to government politics, so to say, and. Uh, uh, this dialogue was sponsored, was encouraged, was uh, uh, supported by governments of both sides. And just, I'm not sure that th this, this is the only form of dialogue that historians are allowed to dream of, so to say. And uh, how did it, uh, uh, so this form of dialogue that is strongly government supported, uh, just look at the, for example, look at the uh, uh, publications, very impressive, very valuable publications, of uh, the uh, group uh, for uh, difficult issue, for difficult matters, uh, uh, um, th 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 these public publications features uh, members of the of this uh, committee uh, converse and meet with presidents, with prime ministers of uh, both countries. That is the government, the state's presence, the state's in the, both states' involvement in this dialogue is very, very palpable. And it can, how it can, uh, how can it impact? How can it affect? Uh, 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 so say, histor broader historical communities, broader historical developments. I uh, I, would, I would point to just to, to one um, possible consequence of the Polish-Russian rapprochement and, his, and the activization of historical dialogue in 2010. I, uh, being a historian, uh, be, being committed to empirical uh, evidence, I cannot prove it uh, uh, convincingly. But my feeling is that uh, Polish-Russian rapprochement uh, affected uh, politics of memory in Ukraine in 2010. Uh, I'm, I'm just sorry for encroaching in the domain of Mikola, but just I just this is just an observation. Uh, the, uh, Viktor Yanukovych's coming to power almost coincided with the uh, Smolensk uh, tragedy, and uh, uh, following uh, following uh, thaw in uh, Polish-Russian relations. And uh, one can surmise that Yanukovych, in his uh, initial gestures toward Russia, uh, imit tried, to, tried to imitate this uh, spirit of detente. Uh, I mean, so he obviously and he immediately mitigated uh, several aspects, or just uh, he immediately played down several aspects of the previous president Viktor Yushchenko politics of memory, especially uh, in the, especially the issue of Hol Holodomor. Uh, uh, the, the whole construction of uh, the memories about Holodomor was not cancelled, was not was not sent to oblivion. It still remains. A part of, uh, um, so to say, officially sponsored uh, memories about Ukraine and past part of the historical narrative of the nation. However, Yanukovych was quick to play down the genocidal aspect of uh, previous Yushchenko's uh, campaign 
uh, not making direct announcements, not uh, 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 recognizing them directly. So he withdrew from making strong points about uh, Hol the Holodomor as a genocide against the Ukrainian nation. Obviously, that was part of general uh, thought, so to say, of historical politics in the region. And that was more particularly a gesture of reconciliation towards the um, Russian government and Russian uh, uh, government-sponsored historians. Immediately after that, pres uh, the then Russian President Medvedev uh, visited in a, in a benevolent gesture the Holodomor Memorial in Kyiv. Uh, uh, precisely uh, that he, uh, preci doing precisely what he uh, re refused to do, had refused to do uh, a couple of years uh, before uh, just rejecting uh, Yushchenko's invitation. So, and I'm not quite sure that this kind of thaw, um, okay, uh, uh, really, can, can, can fully benefit uh, multi-leveled and multifaceted historical dialogue. As a consequence, just talking about, um, talking about uh, uh, common neighbor, neighbors, for example, uh, my feeling is that um, uh, th this politics of reconciliation or other or politics of um, playing down uh, c m m uh, historical controversies uh, resulted, for example, in uh, hindering uh, on, in the Ukrainian part in hindering uh, a critical number of Ukrainian histori uh, historians from confronting the issue of the Volin massacre. Uh, yet another uh, burning issue, uh, uh, this time in, in the Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations and the Polish-Ukrainian historical dialogue, um, and uh, uh, being. Because, because Yanukovych, Yanukovych's reversal, Yanukovych's revision of previous politics of memory obviously uh, created a feeling of threat to, Ukrainian, to, to, to the Ukrainian nationhood, to the Ukrainian national consciousness, and historians, really historians, uh, uh, feel uh, mm, really vulnerable, feel, to, to feel, feel, feel vulnerable in their efforts to built up a strong n n n uh, 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 national narrative and such a, such a complicated issue, such a burning issue as the Volin massacre of 1943 uh, is one of the issues uh, that uh, cannot be discussed fruitfully in this um, climate very strongly affected by the government, by the government dialogue. And uh, just maybe uh, I will, I will Take advantage from, from maybe from possible questions to 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 uh, expand on this. But my my final point would be about um, very briefly uh, about Polish uh, about what was not what has not been but maybe still could be borrowed from Polish experience, both by Russia and and for example and uh, Ukraine as as. Uh, Poland and Russia's common neighbor. I mean the, uh, that uh, for all uh, passions, for all um, uh, uh, maybe for all uh, vitriol of uh, debates, public debates in Poland about uh, historical issues, uh, Polish historians were able to develop uh, meaningful public discussions, meaningful public uh, debate and, and come up with, uh, cons with a kind of consensus. And the uh, a very eloquent example here is the case of Yudvabne, uh, uh, the uh, first uh, uh, brought up by the uh, uh, Polish-American historian Jan Gross, the, the case of a mass murder of uh, Jews in a small town in, the East, uh, in, in, in eastern Poland in 1941. Uh, a case that uh, made the Polish society at large face the uh, issue of collective responsibility and guilt for the participation in the uh, Holocaust. So uh, debates were enormously passionate and they, uh, in fact, they are going on, uh, although their peak fall, uh, fell on the 2002-2005 on the years 2002-2005 and uh, uh, and in, in fact, uh, some meaningful segment, a considerable segment of Polish historian profession 
uh, came up with, with, with a new sense of uh, responsibility uh, for uh, national for, for, for the for, for the crimes for the uh, perpetrate for, for the for the historical crimes for which uh, the nation should feel uh, responsibility. Nothing comparable, in my view, in uh, to my knowledge, nothing comparable happened in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, uh, just uh, Mikola mentioned this fa this notorious uh, um, notorious issue of the uh, uh, atrocities committed by the Soviet army against civilians in, the, in uh, Germany and Eastern Europe in 1945. Uh, another possible issue to serve as a trigger to discuss the collective responsibility for the nation's crime uh, could be the issue of uh, collaborations of uh, 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 Soviet citizens with the Nazi in the present-day territory of the Russian Federation, uh, but nothing, nothing comparable, nothing comparable with the Yedvabne case is uh, just can be seen, can be detected in Russia. And uh, the case of Ukraine, I'm afraid here is similar rather to Russia, to Russia rather than Poland. Also, the uh, Valin massacre. Is, is a muted issue in uh, present-day politics of memory in Ukraine. Uh, the uh, uh, issue of the uh, Ukrainian insurgent army in the Holocaust uh, that is uh, hotly debated now in the historical professions also seem to be far, just to be very, very remote from the core of public debate in Ukraine. And uh, here is the I think that here is the he, he, here is the perspective for here is prospects for furthering uh, dialogue between historians and uh, that's really a point where on where the uh, Ukrainian and Russian historians uh, could borrow more bold, more boldly and more fruitfully from uh, Polish uh, grappling with the really difficult issues of the past. Thank you, Michal. I hate to interrupt you because this was very interesting. Thank you. That was done. Okay, uh, questions now. I'm going to jump in with the first one. From what I gather, maybe establishing uh, a Belarusian-Russian and a Ukrainian-Russian group similar to the Polish-Russian would be very difficult, unless we call it the group for currently impossible matters. <laughs> but, uh, but I have a question both of you raised, uh, particularly in the case of Belarus. It sounds as though you need an internal dialogue. Uh, Belarusian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian, Ukrainian dialogue on difficult matters. Uh, how far is this? Is anybody thinking about this? Is anybody moving this in a similar way? I don't mean sort of both sides shouting at each other, but sitting down actually discussing things seriously. In Belarus, uh, there is no dialogue, and uh, the situation is that uh, the opposition probably in the worst shape ever. Uh, Lukashenko has so much uh, resources from Russia that he doesn't care even to have a dialogue with uh, IMF so much. Things may change in the second half of the year because he is facing a uh, difficult uh, loan problem. He has to pay a lot of cash and uh, the macroeconomic policy inside the country is far from uh, being sane. So, uh, but this Polish-Russian dialogue and the platform, I think the mere existence of such an institution is a very positive factor because that destroys, not just much, but that sends a very good signal to uh, people inside Belarus and uh, a very disturbing signal for Lukashenko. But if Poland and Russia agrees on something and start talking to each other instead of like uh, blaming each other for so many things, then uh, it will be very difficult for him to play uh, like this game of, oh, okay, uh, I'm in favor of Russia, I'm against Poland. I'm in favor of Poland, EU, I'm not uh, with Russia. So the mere existence, I really hail this kind of uh, dialogue attempt because really we're very far from the culture of dialogue itself. And in 1991, nine, let me remind you, we are much closer when uh, Ambassador Vig that time OEC uh, had and uh, Ambassador Kozak, uh, they managed somehow to set up a dialogue then that, that was destroyed so but I think that the only uh, kind of realistic factor that could push us to the dialogue is the crisis Nicola? 
first of all, I, I, I not quite agree with uh, what um, Hill uh, told about uh, uh, difficult issues like Volin or UPA uh, completely muted. Yes, uh, of course, uh, they, uh, they are muted, but not completely. Uh, I mean that um, we have, uh, luckily enough, we have pretty good dialogue between Ukrainian and uh, Polish uh, uh, societies, between, at least between intellectuals. We, have, uh, we see uh, good partners in Poland, and uh, there are pa Polish partners in Ukraine for such a dialogue. And uh, as you remember, there was pretty, pretty successful uh, uh, successful rec reconciliation gestures uh, in 2002-2003 in Volinia, uh, in uh, Lviv, uh, this uh, Svantaj Orlet military cemetery. And now we are also preparing in July, uh, in a few weeks, we are preparing also uh, a number of actions uh, commemorating Volinia massacre. Uh, so uh, it's not that bad. Uh, what is really bad is that um, these issues like UPA are hijacked in Ukraine by uh, Sovietophile, uh, or, or largely Ukrainophobic uh, political forces, and they, uh, they try to employ this issue to, to discredit all things Ukrainian. You know, it's, there's, a pro there's a problem which really complicates the entire issue. It's really, I, I feel it, I, I feel this very powerful challenge, how to, how to say the truth, but, the sa but at the same time not to, uh, to identify yourself with this, you know, very ugly people like Kolesnichenko and all these guys who, who are really uh, very speculative, very demagogic and very, very dirty, actually. Um, they don't care about truth, they just care about discrediting everything, you know. That's uh, it's really a very special issue. Um, uh, regarding Ukraine and Ukraine dialogue, it's really a very important issue. I, I fully agree that we need it maybe even more than Ukrainian, Russian or whatever. It's still, still uh, it's, it's, I would say it's only in embryonic uh, form today. There are some attempts, but not, not, uh, not powerful enough. Thanks, Michal. Let's open up now to uh, questions, comments. James, you already have been introduced as a uh, speaker. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> or a question, should I say. So please go ahead. Thanks very much, and uh, my compliments, uh, congratulations to the panel. I was hoping I could get the three of you to focus on the values issues that were raised in the last panel and I, I, by, by putting it in the following way. Um, Yanukovych, like all his predecessors in Ukraine, has publicly identified Ukraine's future with Europe and the European system. And therefore, in that context, the Europe's involvement in discussion about values and internal matters has an essential legitimacy uh, in Ukraine, and no one can quarrel with it. Um, but in the case of Russia, you are looking not only at elites, but a large part of society who define their values and their policy in, t in opposition to those that are advanced by Brussels. And the question then, I think, has to be who in Russia benefits from conducting a public argument uh, over internal matters in Russia uh, about this question. And just to put this in very practical terms, what has, made, what has the greater influence in Russia today, in a positive sense? The Magnitsky Act or the EU's third energy package, which is an example of upholding our values and practices in our own jurisdiction about the way business is, the business is conducted. Um, so I'll just leave it I will just leave it there, but I'd be grateful if you could uh, engage with that issue. Thanks. Oh, sorry, you got Adam here. Thank you very much. In fact, my intention is to explain because it, is, it seems to me that misunderstanding, because I was impressed by comments made by Mikhail Dolbilov, but uh, it seems to me that he does not understand that it was not uh, the, the group on difficult matters is not a group of historians. There are some historians, but the, the problem was not to find something new, 
to uh, make a kind of the research. Not at all, because we have had different interpretations of history in Poland and in Russia. And we will have this difference also in the future, because all the nations, they have the right to their own national memories. The problem is only how to discuss, to introduce the language between intellectuals, historians, sociologists, etc., just to discuss the real problems, not something what is invented by politicians. And uh, therefore, I raise that question that the very fundamental point of departure was depoliticized dialogue. In other words, to discuss the, re to discuss the real facts, the truth. The truth is not detrimental. It could be uncomfortable. It is very often uncomfortable, but it has to be accepted that as a point of departure, it should not be the victim of the dialogue. It should not be the victim of reconciliation. Reconciliation starts by a recognition of facts and uh, then one can interpret. Having said that, I would like to say that the aim of the of dialogue, which was initiated in 2008 between Poland and, and Russia was with an intention to open the public debate and uh, the public debate which should be based on truth and facts with an intention that politicians will not discuss about the history. They should discuss about the problems which are oriented to the future because up to 2008 we have had the, the situation that Ministers of Foreign Affairs discussed about the facts. And my last point is the following, just to, to demonstrate what I have in mind. We organized in 2009, not only the, uh, uh, the meeting connected with uh, uh, cutting at, and many other issues which were sensitive, but for example, Pact Molotov-Ribbentrop. It was an international uh, conference organized in the Royal Castle, by the way, uh, originally, Germans wanted to organize this in Berlin, Russians in Moscow, and I told them that it would be very difficult for us to accept to discuss Pact, uh, Ribbentrop Molotov Pact, in the same building where it was signed. <laughs> <laughs> it would be better to discuss in, at the Royal Castle in Warsaw. They accepted uh, eventually, after many, many uh, meetings and discussions. It was, and my intention was to demonstrate as a kind of the uh, small exposition to display map which was signed, the original map which was signed by Re uh, Stalin and Hitler, not only Ribbentrop and Molotov, but it was uh, the map which was signed by Stalin personally uh, uh, about the frontier. Th this map was, uh, by the way, attached to the uh, secret protocols in uh, later on uh, it was not in, in August, but in September 39. And the Russians told me that, unfortunately, we do not have uh, an original. It disappeared. We do not have an original. So uh, I, I said, OK, we asked them, the Germans, because I have seen in German uh, foreign ministry, and we displayed, I would say, this map with an intention to demonstrate what happened. It, it, it was done, by the way, for the first time. And in such a way, this problem is not more a kind of the political uh, element of the discussion because facts are now accepted, they are known. And that was an intention to establish. And those meetings, by the way, when you mentioned the photographs with Putin, uh, Tusk, etc., they were with an intention to demonstrate that those independent uh, uh, intellectuals who accepted to participate in, in the work of the group opened the way for the politicians to, to continue uh, the, the uh, uh, negotiation about the future, of, about the present. This is, in, in my view, a very important element just to understand what the whole group was about. Uh, very short. Uh, um, Two questions, two issues. I would like to, to follow um, uh, Adam Daniel Rothfeld's point 
and uh, remind all of us that in, in September 1999, Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued an official statement uh, with no official interpretation of Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. It's, it, it was quite a unique situation when, where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs engaged itself in a kind of the pol uh, historical debate. That's uh, one comment. Another comment, um, I was, uh, it was inspired by uh, Michał Dovbiov in intervention. Um, uh, I would like uh, to hear his comment uh, on the following thought. Russian historiography is divided into two uh, camps uh, um, uh, nowadays. First, uh, uh, first one writes for, let's say, a global reader. So it has to uh, um, um, shape the argument uh, in the way which, is, which may be challenged by the other authors. Um, and there is another group of uh, Russian historians who um, uh, um, write mostly for domestic purposes and domestic reader. Uh, I, um, they can afford to ignore the facts or to shape the interpretation uh, having in mind that nobody is, uh, is able to contest it. Uh, engaging these uh, historians from the second group to the uh, project of, uh, well, joint book, which is going to appear, which, well, appeared in Polish first, then in Russian, and is going to appear in English as well, is also the method of um, influencing the way how they, they are carry, carrying uh, debate about historical issue in Russia itself, because they have to shape the argument in a completely different way they have done uh, uh, until now. Thank you. Okay. Let's uh, start with you, Mikhail. Uh, thank you for uh, comments. Uh, uh, very briefly, just I would direct very briefly to the comments and questions from Professor Rothfeld and Professor Dembski. Mm, I regret if I, um, so if I, if I um, sounded as if I uh, cast, in, as if I cast doubt uh, on uh, the activities uh, of the group for uh, difficult issues. Certainly that was not my intention. Maybe just I put, I, I just made my point too bluntly. Mm, but m Certainly, I, I was and am aware that the group uh, was created to uh, to develop in interpretations, to develop, uh, to to elaborate a consensus around difficult issues. And certainly, uh, uh, if I uh, focus on uh, historians and historical stuff, uh, that's that's because of my uh, perspective on uh, as as a historian. But uh, in my, my another point would be that um, uh, the, the very notion of difficult issues, difficult matters, how they are, uh, how they are conceptualized. Just to very briefly give an example, uh, this uh, current year, uh, 2000, uh, 2014, is the uh, sesquicentennial anniversary of the January Uprising. Uh, in uh, Russian Poland of 1863. That's enormously, th th that was an enormously important event for both Polish and Russian history, both Polish and Russian, as much important for Poland as for Russia. During the uh, last uh, decade, uh, there has been much uh, hot scholarly debate and brilliant publications, brilliant monographs on this issue. And uh, this is an extremely and controversial issues for, uh, uh, so say for, for historians' dialogue. This is a very difficult issue in terms of interpretation, both in facts and interpretations. It's, to, it's, it's not yet still quite researched. And uh, so uh, in Russia, this anniversary uh, is, completely, uh, is completely forgotten. Just, a, just an occasional conference, uh, an occasional mention, no clear, just no clear attitudes on the part of historical uh, communities. Just, just, it, it, in fact, it, it's passing unnoticed during the year. Polish attitudes uh, are uh, uh, just po Polish reaction, Polish um, discussion, public discussion, so the event is certainly more active. But again, this, uh, so this uh, uh, occasion, uh, uh, was not used, was not uh, used by historians to elaborate, put forth 
uh, a kind of consensus about a very, very important issue of still not yet very distant past, that just 150 years. That means that just this is a, a, an impartial remark that the uh, 20th century, politically fraught, politically charged uh, issues are uh, issues that can resonate in current politics, issues that can be instrumentalized for political purposes, regardless, regardless of the intentions of conscientious and competent historians. So these issues uh, qualify for uh, difficult. Other issues that are from, are from the perspective of professional historians deserve, deserve no less attention and debate. Uh, uh, d don't don't co qualify. That was just. This is not like a kind of attack or assault or on on the very idea of uh, getting together and discussing uh, uh, the issues under under the auspices uh, of uh, uh, governmental structures. But that's just a remark. That's th that uh, current politics and uh, political agenda. Uh, still uh, affect uh, historians' dialogue, institutionalized uh, uh, dialogue. And, um, okay, I think I should stop here. And okay, give my Mikola, you wanna go next? Okay. Um. <coughs> there were two issues I, I feel I need to address. Um, first of all, um, mm, pardon? Yeah, all right. Um, uh, regarding the value uh, issues, uh, yes, it's true. Uh, Yanukovych uh, fully uh, accepts, Yanukovych, his, his political team, accepts uh, European uh, orientation, European uh, identity. But of course, it's a lip service. Uh, I agree that it's, it plays a very important normative role because at least they could be pressed uh, both domestically and internationally uh, in order to meet their, their promises, their declarations. But at the same time, of course, they never believed in these values. That's absolutely. Moreover, they sincerely do not believe. They, 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 they sincerely believe that politics everywhere, all over the world, is about playing with rules, not uh, by the rules. Uh, the West is simply more skillful in this play, and because of this, well, uh, the West is able to, to pressure uh, Ukraine, poor Ukraine government, uh, which is not so skillful. Um, so uh, it's important, uh, of course it's important that they accept this normative uh, value because it enables society and international actors to, to, uh, to, to press them. Um, I um, uh, I agree that uh, the truth cannot be det uh, detrimental, it, uh, but can be uh, uncomfortable for for us, uh, for <laughs> for everybody. And uh, it's not a matter in Ukraine. It's not a matter of uh, of uh, any denial of all, all the things that happened. It's, it's not a matter of justif justification of uh, UPA crimes or uh, participation in, in uh, Holocaust or something like this. But uh, it's rather a problem of indifference. It's a serious problem that the issue is not uh, properly discussed. And of course, there are some attempts to undermine this. But there are no no significant attempts to deny or to to, to justify. I'd like you to understand. That, um, that in Ukraine, uh, and in this terms, Ukraine is much very different from Russia. We don't have any, uh, and never had any uh, unified uh, politic, politics of memory or historical uh, politics. Uh, there was no, no monolithic government. Uh, there are, two, there are very, very different uh, agencies, both in, uh, in the central level and in the regional levels. And of course, there, is, there are very powerful external agents, uh, agents uh, Russia, first of all, uh, so Ukraine has never had any any unified, any uh, homogeneous, so to say, uh, integral um, uh, politics of memory. Um, uh, what is what is what is a, what is a uh, serious problem that uh, all these issues are very difficult to discuss uh, because we have very strong tradition of uh, of Soviet. Uh, Propaganda, which uh, discredited uh, everything uh, wholesale, which uh, painted uh, all uh, everything in, in black and white uh, color, 
And uh, still today, uh, we have this division like, like in Belarus, Be Belarus and Belarusia. We have also Ukraine and U Ukraine, probably. Um, and uh, this uh, Soviet, Soviet Ukrainian part still draws on uh, Soviet nationalism. And Soviet nationalism was banal nationalism. If you, if you remember Michael Billig's excellent book, uh, you probably understand that uh, it's much easier to, to hide this banal nationalism. It's powerful, it's very, very very strong, but at the same time, it's almost invisible, because it's uh, it's uh, it's banal. It's usual. It's uh, in daily formulas, in uh, in uh, daily discourses, practices. Uh, it's much more difficult to notice it, but it's very powerful. And uh, today, uh, today's Soviet uh, Ukrainian Soviet part of society uh, inherited this all these uh, discourses, and they and because of this, they can uh, they can adopt, they can apply uh, old uh, old old rhetorical discursive formulas uh, uh, against their opponents. And this complicates uh, any historical discussion in Ukraine very, very much. I feel it. Yarek? Yeah. Uh, f uh, it's very challenging to talk about value-based policies and dialogue in the country, where Brezhnev is considered to be the most successful prime minister. Stalin is considered to be a good manager. And the breakup of the Soviet Union as the biggest geopolitical catastrophe. This is not about Putin. This is about a lot of people in Russia. And uh, from different consolidated groups, something that is missing from the picture of geopolitical people and democracy people and human rights people is something that we really should revise somehow or add to the potential of uh, all our missionary work. And the group that is uh, the most likely to talk about value-based policies and change is entrepreneurs and small business. Uh, something that is not part of many, many activities. But these people have a lot of things to lose. They learn how to do business, how to be independent. They value uh, achievement, the culture of achievement. And this is something that is not part of the agenda of uh, traditional like democracy-based organization. So I think that uh, if we include SMEs, I'm not talking about big guys like uh, ExxonMobil, like all these uh, transnational corporations, they find very good ways to talk to big governments. But SMEs plus civil society activists who talk about, for example, corruption, and the case of Navalny shows you in Russia that uh, I'm talking not about the, this particular person with his nationalistic agenda, I'm talking about the corruption as an issue. And this is getting more, much more important in Belarus as well. Because Lukashenko deals with that issue all the, all, the, all the time. And he's been fighting with corruption 20 years without... So yeah, exactly, exactly. And now he just... Yesterday he said that construction is a mafia and corruption again. So uh, I think that this is what we should take into account and integrate into any activities. Support small SME initiative entrepreneurship development through the tools because this is what people understand. Uh, if you talk about just democracy, just about like uh, history, you know, this is the thing that probably make more division lines than uh, dialogue platforms. Okay, unless somebody has a burning question, I can't wait to the next conference, which we're going to be planning soon. Uh, I think we'll finish there, and I'd like to thank our panelists. I think they all finished in first place in our own song contest, so give them another hand. <laughs> Swavek, you, you want to come up? You have some concluding thoughts? <clears throat> I have some concluding remarks. First of all, um, uh, I would like to say that we are going to, to disseminate uh, um, a brief paper, a uh, brief policy paper on the basis of this conference. Um, uh, and the paper is going to be written jointly by uh, our center and, and uh, Hitler Conley, Janusz Bugajski and uh, their team. Um, the second uh, um, um, conclusion, concluding remarks concern, uh, concerns um, next conference. Uh, I would like to invite um, all of you uh, for the next year. We are going to uh, bring this platform uh, of Polish-Russian uh, dialogue uh, to Washington DC again, uh, cooperating in this regard with CSIS. And this leads me to the last uh, 
concluding remarks. I would like to thank uh, Hitler Conley, Janusz Bugajski, Day Team, CSS, for giving us the floor um, here uh, in these uh, venues. Next conference is going to be held in new venues. Congratulations, congratulations. So um, uh, I think that uh, uh, the, full, the crowd in this, uh, in this room today showed that there is uh, a need to talk about more about the region, about the dialogue between uh, Poland and Russia, and last but not least, to think more strategically about uh, the impact um, of, uh, well, Polish-Russian terms may have on wider Europe and transatlantic relations. I think the next conference we uh, should focus uh, even more on a strategic approach, um, given the fact that uh, we um, devoted two, already two conferences on description uh, what's going on uh, between Poland and Russia and how it may influence uh, the European theme. That was my last sentence during this conference. Thank you.